Hello, welcome to our April DBS Macro Insights live stream. I'm Tim Rubek, Chief Economist. Uh, I'm actually, is, I'm not doing this from Singapore. I'm here in San Francisco, it's one o'clock in the morning here, but uh, it's gotta be done. And I'm pleased that our technology is holding up and we welcome all of you warmly to this uh, uh, timely uh, discussion on the global inflation outlook, as well as a couple of other very pertinent issues. Uh, with me are Nathan Chow, Senior Economist, dialing in for Hong Kong. Hi, Nathan. And we also have Chang Wei Young, our Hi, credit Tom. strategist. Hi. Hi, Tim. Hi, everyone. Hey, great to have you guys. So we have Wei Young from Singapore, Nathan from Hong Kong, and yours truly, Tamer, from uh, San Francisco. Um, we will talk about the three big shocks that are hitting the global economy as we speak. Of course, as the title suggests, we will talk about the high global inflation uh, in, and how that will manifest in various stress points for asset classes and economies. Um, but mind you that there are two kinds of inflation. One is this whole COVID inflation, creating supply side disruption uh, and then massive amount of fiscal stimulus causing substantial demand uh, and the bottleneck of supply chain disruption because of COVID as well as COVID response related cash going into people's demand function have created this uh, uncomfortable inflation outcome for a variety of economies. But beyond that, in the last few months of this year, we've also had conflict inflation, a massive crisis out of Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, and the two countries, as we've all read in newspapers in great detail, uh, have a substantial output of uh, global uh, wheat and oil and gas demand. Uh, and uh, disruption to any of those supplies uh, could be very problematic for food and energy security, particularly for Europe, but also for many other countries in the world. And that sphere, that risk premia has also fed into an additional upward dynamic as far as inflation is concerned. So we have COVID inflation and we have conflict inflation. Uh, so we will talk about both of those and then what that means for policy and emerging markets. Uh, the, Two shocks that I mentioned are also one in the US and one in the Euro area. In the US, the shock of inflation has propelled the Federal Reserve into giving very hawkish signals for a series of large rate hikes that are in the pipeline. The market has been nervous about it. We have seen that in the fixed income markets as well as global markets for equities, particularly for growth of stocks. And then the second shock, of course, is the conflict around Ukraine and Russia, which is creating a massive dampener in consumer and investment sentiments in the Euro area. And the third shock on which Nathan will come in is the uh, COVID exacerbation in China and the various lockdown measures that are taking place. Can China do the best of both worlds, which is pursue a zero COVID policy, but at the same time, keep the supply chain going? Uh, I personally don't think so, but maybe Nathan has some insight that'll make us a little more optimistic than where I stand. And then the, action at the government end, meaning policy rates going up, Gavi rates going up, will of course have a massive knock-on impact on the credit space, which is the private sector bond issuance um, uh, world, uh, both with respect to investment grade bonds and high yield bonds. And as interest rates go up, find to, hard to see if any, there are major silver linings around that, but that's where William will come in and get, get into some somewhat detailed analysis of what the credit space is looking like in the middle of all these interest rate increases. So that's the overview. Uh, let's go to the next slide and take a look at the three parts that we're gonna talk about. So I will begin uh, in the, on slide two, uh, talking about inflation's shadow, uh, supply demand side issues and policy issues and what that means for asset prices. Uh, that would take hopefully no more than 15 minutes. After that, uh, Nathan will come in and talk about China, hopefully no more than 15 minutes and then Last but not least, uh, William will talk about the critical juncture between interest rates and credit in his section. Uh, and then at the end, if we have time, uh, I certainly will have some questions and follow-ups for William and Nathan. And by the way, William and Nathan, you may have follow-ups for me as well. Uh, so let's move on. Um, the outline for my side of the presentation, my first 15 minutes is on slide three. Uh, there's a lot of words there, uh, state of demand, state of supply, inflation outlook, monetary policy outlook, recession scenario. This is the big R that the market participants have started to talk about in the last couple of weeks. I mean, amazing. I mean, we're talking about a hot economy propelling the Fed into rate, rating, uh, rate increases. 
And as a result, the market is already pricing in the impact of that rate increase, which hasn't happened yet on growth outcome in the three to five quarter horizons. So we have to talk about that and we'll end the session by talking about investment implications. All right, let's start by looking at the state of demand, slide four. Um, we have a US economy being propelled by very strong consumer demand, both at the durable uh, sales, uh, durable goods demand, as well as housing. On the durable goods side, uh, retail sales have been doing extremely well in double digit numbers, despite having sort of the favorable base effect begin to fade um, in the last three, four months, and still we're seeing mid-teens uh, sales growth, um, both uh, for overall retail sales, but even if you take out cars and trucks and parts, and we know that there is pending demand for that, even then you see very strong numbers. So the Americans are still flush with a lot of the cash that they got in 2020, 2021 from as part of the COVID stimulus packages, not even a third of that has been spent. So they have the power to keep spending even as in 2022, the stimulus measures fade. So don't think the fading of the stimulus measure is directly correlated with the dampening of uh, consumption demand. Uh, people didn't spend all the money, so they still have money to spend. Uh, and the second thing is that beyond goods, uh, people have also begun to spend money in services. Uh, I am talking to you from San Francisco. You step out. Now the malls are getting full. The restaurants are full. People are booking flights. They're traveling. Uh, Large-scale events like sporting events and entertainment events and conferences related to work are all on, uh, and therefore spending is not just concentrated on goods like it was a couple of years ago or the last two years, but now it's spreading into services as well. All in all, it looks good. Uh, housing market, which is, of course, um, theoretically at least, uh, very sensitive to interest rates, so far is showing no sign of panic whatsoever. Inventory is low. Prices are up substantially. Uh, I'm pretty sure that mortgage rates going from uh, 2 to 3%, depending on the tenor you're looking at, to 4 to 5% is going to be problematic for the housing market. And that would be one issue we will talk about later in terms of downside risks for the economy. But uh, right now, again, conjuncturally speaking, housing demand is very, very strong. Next slide, please. Um, a little more on the state of demand. So we talked about the housing market. We talked about retail sales. Uh, of course, all of this is being propelled by very, very strong uh, labor market dynamic. I have surveyed the restaurant industry in my own little small sample survey in the last 24 hours in the Bay Area. And if you work at a restaurant, if you're a waiter or a hostess or a host, at the front of the desk, you are making 20 to $30 an hour. Amazing numbers. I mean, these were not numbers that we saw even a couple of years ago. Market is very tight. Unemployment rate is down to 3.6%. I suppose, you know, basically back to the best of what we saw in the pre-COVID times. And uh, unlike the pre-COVID times when wage growth was muted, we're talking about 5 6% wage growth overall in the market with hospitality industry in particular seeing uh, high double digit, you know, 15, 20% increases uh, while construction and other areas more like five, 6%. So some of these wages are keeping up with inflation, some are not, but overall, nominally speaking, we're talking about one of the hottest labor market uh, wage demand uh, from uh, the wage earners and just hiring demand from the employers. Um, the next chart is not, not necessarily only about the US, but we're putting in the data surprise uh, numbers for Eurozone, China, and the US. China had some anomalous, uh, hard to understand data releases earlier uh, last month, uh, which led to massive upward surprise. Uh, I think I'll let Nathan talk about that later. Uh, we are all a bit uh, unconvinced by that pop. We think that the Chinese economy has quite a few headwinds, but in the US and Eurozone area, uh, there is still some positive surprises, but I think we can all safely say that the outlook, particularly in the Euro area, is looking pretty dour around the energy shortage that is looming. Next slide. Um, now, in terms of outlook, again, the first slide I have on this chart, or the first chart I have on the slide, I'll repeat it a little later because it bears uh, scrutinizing in a different context. But here you can just see that input costs were beginning to ebb for a while in the IFC manufacturing survey. Now, again, uh, they've gone up um, on the back of energy spike. We're talking about core PC at about five and a half percent. I think it is going to top out soon simply because there are some very strong base effects in play, but sequentially we're not going to get any breathing room anytime soon. 
Uh, so broader commodity prices. I'll talk about the more granular commodity a little later. Uh, they are up uh, not a lot by historical standards. I mean, if you invested a hundred dollar in gold in 2010, you just be about 175 today. So 75% return over 12 years is not you know, stuff of dream. The stock market has done two X or three X of that. Um, and similarly, if you're talking about industrial metals like uh, copper or crude oil, again, we're talking about no more than 50, 60% increase over a 12 year horizon. It looks a lot right now, but both in real and nominal terms, we are not strangers to what's happening in the energy and commodity markets despite the COVID risk premia, as well as the conflict risk premia getting embedded in these things. Okay, beyond the inflation outlook, uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, we, we need to sort of contextualize the supply side. Uh, firstly, um, the big bottleneck, which was moving goods from China to the US, which was proxied heavily by the Shanghai to LA container rate, but also there are these overall indices you can get, the Shanghai Freight Index, which is like a composite of 13 different freight rates of moving goods to various parts of the world from Holland uh, to uh, US, uh, East Coast, West Coast, et cetera. Uh, that looked extremely worrisome uh, late last year. It took cost $12,000 to move a container, a 40 foot container from Shanghai to LA. Things have come down a bit. Uh, LA ports are functioning 24 seven. Uh, demand probably is not as uh, substantial as it was uh, and supply related disruptions have eased a bit. Uh, but then again, Nathan will have to come and tell us that it's not gonna go back up on the back of various port shutdowns or maybe the ports are running despite the lockdowns in the city. Uh, but there are other shipping rates uh, which suggest uh, not just a question of supply but also a question of demand. Uh, one would be proxied by the Baltic Drive freight which is um, basically the rate that the Chinese importers pay for various uh, drive freight that they import. Uh, that peaked in late 21 and has come down sharply. I think that just reflects subdued demand in China as reflected in the weakening of the manufacturing PMI below 50. I'm gonna stop talking about China. That will be Nathan's job later on. Slide eight. Uh, but there are many other moving parts. As I said earlier, that I'm gonna repeat the US price trend chart, uh, which was shown earlier on slide six, is that the relationship between input prices and core inflation, as you can see over time, I mean, they tend to follow each other, especially if there's some zigzags. So if you have manufacturers complaining bitterly about input prices, it will show up in core inflation sooner or later. And again, uh, we were getting excited, hopeful, uh, when we saw that part from late 21 onward, the manufacturers were saying their input prices were easing a bit but just as COVID inflation ebbs, we get conflict inflation, which sort of creates this problem right now. And, uh, and also similarly on the commodity side, uh, there are issues to worry about uh, that, uh, you know, as a hedge, maybe gold makes sense, uh, but why are we seeing such spike in oil demand? Uh, probably not, more, more likely it is reflecting supply side uncertainties. Okay, let's move on. So as I said, that you know there are two kinds of inflation. There's a COVID inflation, there's a conflict inflation. I think supply side issues, COVID related uh, boost to demand because of stimulus expenditure, all of those things were very, very well priced in through the course of 2021. Uh, so what about 2022? I can say that we can sort of separate the COVID inflation from conflict inflation if we just look at the year to date price evolution because the Ukraine conflict really manifested in January, February, and then had a full bone uh, you know, playing, playing out uh, through late February, March, and then spilling into April. So year to date, uh, we have some serious commodity inflation. So ignore the earlier chart where I said, historically, these are not extremely worrisome numbers. Yes, that's true, but it's not only about history. It's about near-term developments and near-term expectations. And if we going to have uh, prices of gas oil and nickel and natural gas rise by 50 to 70% in the first three and a half months of 2022, we have some serious problems because this will pass through to a wide range of prices if they don't come down. So a resolution to the conflict in Ukraine is absolutely critical if we're gonna get this conflict risk premium dissipate and bring us back to again, looking at sort of normal inflation. These sort of numbers are not normal. These are you know, very stressful for the market Traders get uh, margin calls, positions get um, uh, liquidated, um, 
you know, bad things can happen for our trading firms, for speculators, uh, and of course, real economy can be impacted very badly if these sort of things persist for month after month. Uh, I mean, look at the middle part of this chart. It's not just about metals and energy, uh, corn, cotton, wheat, uh, these prices, soybean, these prices are also up between 20 and 40% in the last three months. That is not good. Uh, harbinger for major social unrest in the countries where these are important inputs for uh, feedstock, for bread, for staples. Uh, people don't like everyday purchases, prices going up by 20, 30%. We saw this in the context of Arab Spring. A big driver was the big drought in the preceding two years in Syria and elsewhere, and the spike in bread prices. Let's hope and pray that similar things don't happen again and we don't see uh, mass demonstrations on the streets of Asia and Africa and the Middle East, uh, which, which can be very, very negative for the global outlook, markets, economy, societies, everything. Um, move on to the next slide. <clears throat> the, uh, you know, news reports are, are not just for analysts like us and investors like you. Everyday company owners, small business owners, they're also seeing what's happening. Uh, and, and it is manifesting in their behavior. So I have from you from the US, but you know, these sort of surveys are now can be replicated for anywhere in the world. These shocks are common. People are behaving and responding more or less the same way, which is why we're not just looking at inflation going up in the US, but all over the world. Uh, NFIB small business survey pricing question, are you planning to raise prices in the coming days? Are you raising prices right now? And in both of these cases, more than 50% have been saying, yes, uh, I'm planning on raising prices and I am raising prices as we speak. In fact, I am raising prices as we speak is close to 70% of the respondents. A little mild source of comfort that the person uh, who will be uh, raising prices now, um, you know, will be raising prices down the road, have come down just a tad, but these are still extremely uncomfortable numbers, numbers that we have not seen in the last 20, 30 years. So this is like a you know, 1970s style situation. And the thing is that if everybody's planning on raising prices, then the question of expectations getting affected, of course, come in. And uh, if your input prices are up, which is the right-hand side slide, black line, uh, then sooner or uh, the red line, then of course, you, know, you are going to start thinking about uh, how much you charge, which is a black line prices receive part. So if you are paying a lot, you will start receiving by meaning charging more so that you receive more. Uh, so that, that gap is substantial and worrisome. And uh, of course, from the Fed to other government uh, monetary policy bodies, everybody is very, very worried. Uh, next slide, please. So inflation outlook for the US. Uh, you know, I have to confess that I've had to revise up my forecast repeatedly in the course of the last six to 12 months. Um, the, the base effect related discussion, the COVID inflation fading, transitory factors, all of those things were contemplated and unfortunately had to be ditched as the inflation dynamic turned out to be very, very strong. So people like Larry Summers are clearly having an ascendancy as far as their arguments are concerned because their point a year ago when we were all looking at rather depression-like scenarios, his argument a year ago was we're actually overstimulating the economy and this will manifest in inflation. And uh, not many People bought that argument, myself included, uh, but Mr. Summers is a very smart person, clearly um, is, uh, got his pulse on this issue pretty well, more ahead of Federal Reserve and most analysts. Anyway, uh, even then, uh, the base effect cannot be denied. Um, we had a big jump in inflation a year ago, or, and then that will start pushing down the year-on-year -year calculation for inflation, even if sequential inflation remains strong in the coming months. The problem is, even with that favorable base effect, even with some disinflation taking place, we're not talking about 2% inflation anywhere in the 22, 23 forecasting horizon. So this rather optimistic chart that sees inflation falling like a rock still is talking about a well above 2% uh, core inflation uh, through end of 2023. This is where the Fed reaction function comes in. If you're forecasting horizon, you are nowhere close to targeting your average 2% inflation, you have to start getting ahead of the game. And the only way the Fed can get, get ahead of the game is to take its policy rate ahead of the underlying inflation rate. And hence, taking policy rates by 200 basis points, 225 basis points, is just not going to do. It has to be higher than that 
even if that means some dour implications for growth. Next slide. <clears throat> so we think that the Fed is now on course to hike quickly, substantially, 50 basis points rate hike in May, and maybe again, 50 basis points rate hike in June. Rate hikes will continue. Uh, also expect expedited tapering, which has begun and will probably end by June. And at some point late next year, this year and early next year, there might be also discussions about starting to, um, you know, not rolling over assets, uh, allowing them to expire uh, and the cash to come back to the Fed, meaning quantitative tightening. We will see how the economy does before the Fed starts contemplating that, but it seems to be very much on the cards. So we are now slightly ahead of consensus. I think consensus is looking at a terminal Fed funds rate of about 3%. We think it will probably have to be about 3.5% by mid-2023. That's a massive amount of interest rate increase between now and then uh, will create lots of volatility and turbulence in global markets. You can count on that. Uh, slower growth and uh, a period when we have a bit of a stagflationary situation where growth is slowing, but inflation is high, will probably be also likely on the cards in the next two quarters or three quarters. Move on to the next slide. Um, sorry, next slide, please. Thank you, 13. Uh, so yes, growth will be affected. Um, we were thinking about 3.5% growth in 2022. We have revised that down to 3%. We were probably thinking about uh, close to 25 to 2.6% growth for 2023. We are bringing that down to 2 We will recognize considerable downside risk around even this forecast. Uh, because it's a lot of interest rate hike, it can affect demand quite expeditiously. Uh, two areas, uh, one is of course the asset price. Higher rates could cause a major correction in equity prices worldwide, particularly in the US where valuations are very high. That could lead to negative wealth effects in effect consumption and investment sentiment. The second one is of course housing. Uh, leverage ratios are not worrisome, but again, you know, 200, 300 basis points shock to the mortgages when everybody has been lulled into the comfort of extremely low mortgage rates for over a decade could be problematic for home building, home renovation, appliance purchases, and of course, overall real estate transaction. So three and 2% growth in 22 and 23 in response to the higher rates uh, and uh, with some downside risk. Uh, we're not very worried as far as US households are concerned because A, they are flush with cash. They haven't spent all the COVID stimulus money. Secondly, uh, their leverage ratios are lower. Uh, you can see in the second uh, right-hand slide, uh, households had close to 100% debt to GDP ratio in the lead up to the global financial crisis. It's below 80% now. Uh, corporates have levered up a bit since then, but their profitability cash flow are, are you know, by and large uh, looking very healthy right now. So I think the shock absorption capacity is still there. Next slide. Now comes a deep question. Are we gonna have a recession? Uh, is the yield curve, the two ten spread uh, which is sort of, you know, flirted with negative territory the last week or so, and probably is going to head in that direction. Does that mean, you know, we're heading into recession? Well, a couple of answers to that question. Uh, negative slope does not mean imminent risk of recession. Eventually, there's always a recession, but that doesn't mean that it's in a 12 to 18 month horizon. I mean, just look at the late 1990s, for example, uh, yield curve flattened substantially through 97, 98, 99. Um, but till the dot-com bust came all the way in 2001, uh, you could have been expecting a recession immediately or 12 month horizon, and you would have been wrong for about 36 months or even 48 months uh, before it actually came. Uh, similarly, there are times the yield curve turns negative, turns positive again, and then turns negative, and then you get the recession. Uh, this is the late eighties, for example. So just don't think that it becoming negative today means you know, imminent recession, in fact, uh, when you look at, for example, the New York Fed's recession model, which does not use the two stand spread, but the three month, uh, slide 14, uh, thank you. Uh, the the three month to uh, 10, year, 10 year slope, uh, that is still indicating a very healthy slope and um, not much risk of recession whatsoever. Uh, okay, that's just, you know, reading from the yield curve, but what about beyond that? Let's go to the next slide. Slide 15, please. Thanks. Um, that even if growth slows, and rates are not gonna come down. Rates will remain elevated and on the back of government rates being elevated, we will see uh, risk premia widen, spreads widen, uh, some degree of you know, 
unease in the market with respect to the outlook, all of those things are likely. What do you do with investment under that circumstances? Well, you can still extract quite a decent return from short duration bonds. Maybe you went long short duration bonds a year ago, very smart of you. Then maybe you should be taking some profit now because maybe they have gone as high as they can. But just from a asset liability match perspective, I think these returns are still very attractive. People should hold them unless of course they're looking at just capital gains. Uh, international stocks far more attractively valued than uh, particularly American stocks. And I think that in this situation when rates are going up and very likely that you know, growth stocks will be hurt even more, uh, I think the time for international stocks, Asian EM, China, everything else has come. Growth to value rotation has been going on for a while. I think that continues. Uh, higher rates are not good for growth stocks. We saw this in the lead up to the dot-com bust. We saw this in 2008 as well. I'm pretty sure we're gonna see that again. Uh, and then watch for debt crisis here and there. Just before we started the call, I was discussing this with Will Young. We have all sorts of things uh, with um, uh, Sri Lanka, um, of, of course, Russia, uh, Argentina, um, you know, Pakistan, you know, country after country already we're talking about risk of default around conflict and around balance of payments difficulties. Uh, and that will be a feature for the rest of the year. See a lot of stress in emerging markets. We are, of course, not particularly worried about um, Asia, uh, particularly East Asia. We think that uh, export demand is strong. Uh, inflation is not as big a headache as it is in the West because demand was never that strong. Stimulus measures were not that strong. But of course, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that if there is debt crisis elsewhere, it will not hit uh, there. Contagion risk is, of course, very much there. So keep an eye on all that. It's a um, plethora of risks out there. But in terms of asset price implication, uh, sovereign uh, contagion from some non-Asian uh, crises or some non-East Asian crises are probably going to be something that we have to worry about going forward. All right, uh, I think that's the end of my set of slides. I'm sorry, I took a bit longer than I was supposed to, but there are some serious issues to consider here. Uh, so anyway, without much ado, uh, slide 16, that just says that I'm done and it is time for Nathan. Nathan, all yours. Thank you, Tamo, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the Chinese market has gone through a lot over the past month. Right. Remember the extraordinary, extraordinary sell-off and uh, surge in stock prices a couple of weeks ago. Right. I, I, I think that is one of the wildest swings in recent history. And you know, to boost market confidence, Vice uh, Premier Liu He made quite a lot of, um, quite a number of promises a few weeks ago, uh, including a more proactive monetary policy. Uh, a more gentle approach towards tech firms. And the vice premier also promised to work with the U.S. to resolve the listing risk. So as you can see on next slide, you can see that uh, there is a strong rebound after his speech, right? So the intention, the message that Liu He tried to deliver is very, very obvious. The, the government would not just sit on their hands to let the uh, market plunge, to let the economy to deteriorate further. And the timing is also very, very important because the NPC just announced the 5.5% GDP growth target, right? So you can see the speech of Liu He has set off a stunning surge, right? And the government indeed takes some follow-up actions. They have, for instance, revised some listing rules, allowing U.S regulators to gain access to auditing reports of those Chinese firms listed in New York. So you can take that as a uh, um, compromise that shows Beijing's willingness to balance national security concerns at the time when the economy faces a lot of headwinds, all right? Uh, so that's why stock prices of those companies listed in the U.S. rebounded quite notably, like uh, Ping Door Door and uh, DD Global. However, this is not enough, I guess. Investors are right now expecting more and more policy support. Otherwise, the sentiment could uh, quickly fizzle out. And actually, the real economy definitely needs more, especially given what's happening in Shanghai. Next slide, please. So 
contrary to San Francisco, Tamo, streets right now in Shanghai are empty, literally empty. Shopping malls are empty. 25 million people have been requested to stay home since the last week of March. They cannot even walk their dogs, and some of them has to have to rely on local government for food and daily supplies. All right. So you can see that the traffic chart on the left, uh, the red line, which shows Shanghai literally zero. Right. So obviously the consumption sector is bearing the brunt because everything right now is closed. And because Shanghai is one of the richest regions, it ranks second in terms of GDP per capita, like something like 24,000 or 25,000 US dollar. Right. And the fact that Shanghai is the largest contributing city to the country's retail sales, something like 4%, 4.1, 4.2, right? So the lockdown will hurt the consumption recovery, which is already weak, okay? So that will obviously hurt the rental income of some major landlords. Uh, some of them uh, uh, might have to offer, uh, for instance, rental concessions for their tenants, all right? Uh, so this is what's happening on the um, on the consumption front, and on the other fronts, uh, some positive things happening. Good. One of the good things is that the Shanghai port, which is the world's largest, remain operations. So you can you can, you can take that as a as a policy trick by the Chinese government. It is tweaking its um, zero COVID policy in order to minimize economic disruption. So just like what happened in Shenzhen? They adopted a so-called closed loop system, meaning workers are being uh, transported from their dormitory to the factory and back. So two years ago, if you can still remember, all factories were shut down for months, right? But that is not what is happening right now in Shanghai. So that is one of the good things. However, that doesn't mean business as usual. Okay, I actually talked to some of our clients. For instance, one of them is a car maker. They have exactly adopted the closed loop model. Uh, but the thing is that their production right now is something like two thirds of that before the outbreak. So you can still feel the impact, all right? And even though, just like what I mentioned, the port remains open, uh, some warehouses are closed, logistics are not functioning normally. One of the issues right now is that truck drivers entering or leaving the city, they got to present a negative test result taken, uh, uh, taken within the last 48 hours. So some of them, some of the drivers just do not want to go to Shanghai because of the risk of having to quarantine on their return, All right? So um, another thing is that in China, there is a uh, contact tracing system, a large scale system. If you had close contact with someone who tested positive, you will be uh, quarantined, you will be isolated. So that's another reason uh, that will keep some people away from work for quite a while. So that means in the several weeks ahead, uh, we'll be seeing some sort of labor shortages uh, that will in turn lengthen delivery time. Uh, you can see that on the next slide, meaning supply chain backlogs will sort of persist for quite a while, even after the city reopens, right? So the left chart, the left chart here shows uh, the PBI already uh, shows delivery time uh, deteriorating for quite a while, but it has not, the red line, it has not captured the full picture yet, has not captured most of the blow from the Shanghai lockdown. So we should expect this red line here to add south further. And on the right, some high frequency data also sh shows, such as the oil refinery run rate, it has been dropping at a more rapid rate since the uh, Shanghai lockdown happened, all right? So this is another indicator show, uh, uh, showing production will be under some sort of pressure, at least in April, right? Uh, so let's keep our finger crossed uh, that things will get better in May. Uh, but the thing is that just like what I have been, we have been mentioned over and over uh, in our past webinars, COVID is one of the biggest uncertainties facing the Chinese economy. Unlike the U.S., Federal Reserve is the biggest uncertainty, like how many interest rate 
interest rate hikes there, how fast the Fed is shrinking its balance sheet, right? But in China, COVID is the biggest uncertainty because Beijing is sticking to uh, zero COVID policy that increases the near-term risk to the economy. So if uh, Liu He, if the vice premier really meant what he said, if he, uh, I mean, if the government is serious about the 5.5 growth target, they got to do more, they got to ease more in terms of both fiscal and monetary policy, including unwinding more some of the property curbs. Because at the end of the day, the property sector accounted for close to one third of the country's GDP, all right? Uh, moving on to next chart, I put up some charts here to show you to show you the latest development in the property sector. M most of the leading ind indicator shows that uh, related activities uh, remain kind of uh, subdued, sluggish, all right? And um, even though home prices have been dropping, home sales have been declining still. It failed to attract uh, prospective buyers. And it is understandable because we have been seeing a lot of bad news over the past one and a half year, right? For instance, reports about developers' liquidity issues, news about uh, uh, you know, delivery delays, building delays, all of this are sapping uh, confidence. And that is bad news to developers because most of them rely so much on the proceeds from home sales to replenish their uh, cash flow. So that's why we have been seeing more and more news about default, more and more news about delays in payment, right? So in order to break this negative loop, the government need to roll out more policies. And I expect that to happen if the vice premier really meant what he said, uh, including reducing down payments, subsidizing home purchases, cutting uh, mortgage interest rates, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Some municipals have started doing so uh, recently, but we need to see more. I, I made a call early this year expecting the property sector to, to, to reach its bottom by mid-year. Uh, but for that to happen, we need to see more relaxation, especially in major cities, tier one and tier two, all right? So in the meantime, in order to cushion the slowdown, the government has to spend more, has to build more infrastructure. Next slide, please. So that's why we have been seeing the NDRC has been speeding up its pace in approving infrastructure projects uh, on, the left, on the left chart, right? And the right chart also shows the local governments are speeding up special bond issues, right? Uh, by, the, by the end of March, close to 1.3 trillion special bonds were issued. So that is one of the fastest pace ever. And that is equal, that equals to one third of the full year quarter. So we'll be seeing more and more infrastructures to be kicked off in the second half, uh, like 5G related, AI related data centers, all of them are so-called new infrastructure, right? But also the traditional infrastructure as well like, like uh, uh, re, uh, uh, railroad projects, highways, ports, you know? And in terms of monetary policy, next slide, please. Monetary uh, easing will need to remain in place to support the fiscal effort. Uh, the PBOC got to make sure there is sufficient liquidity in the system, especially bond issuance is picking, picking up the pace, right? Uh, and they got to lower the triple out further uh, because on the on the right, you see excess reserve ratio is still far below the uh, pre-outbreak level. And of course, they got to lower the interest rate more to bring down funding costs. So we are expecting another 20 basis point drop in one year LPR in 2022. And the implication in, on CGB, next slide please, is that it will weigh on the CGB yield. Uh, I, I mean, it is not a surprise to see some profit taking from time to time because you have interest rate differentials coming down and the housing market is sort of under quite a bit of pressure. So that actually partly explains the sell off in February, right? But the bottom line is that even the spread between the US and China 
uh, to shrink further, or even the CGB is to, is to trade below the U.S. Treasuries for a while, I do not expect there will be a massive capital outflow because yield spread is just one of the consideration for foreign investors to hold CGBs. Diversification need is another big reason, right? It's especially in the U.S. right now, going forward, the, the rate high story will continue to unfold, right? Meaning the negative return on global fixed income market may last for a while. But in contrast, uh, CGB is relatively set, uh, stable, making them very attract attractive, right? So I do not expect a massive capital outflow. The shrinking yield spread should not stop the PBOC from loosening more. And even if there is a, a, a sizable outflow, I, I, I think liquidity risk is still manageable because look at the right chart here. Uh, Chinese corporates and commercial banks have accumulated a lot of foreign exchange reserve over, over the past two years, more than the official reserve numbers suggest, because they did not convert all of the uh, FX with the PBOC, right? So this is, this is the war chest of Chinese corporates and banks, right? And on top of official foreign exchange reserves, all of this could provide very, very good, sub, you know, substantial capital buffer going forward, right? So next slide, please. Inflation is also unlikely to constrain PBOC from stepping up their support. Um, as you can see on the left chart, it is true that transportation prices are sort of being boosted up by high energy prices, but they are also part partially offset by the fall in other prices like food prices, pork prices, for instance, right, which will stay in deep deflation for the rest of the year. And then uh, because of the pandemic restrictions, uh, 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 other causes, other costs like uh, recreation, uh, particularly tourism prices, all of them will remain subdued for quite a while. So that's why you are seeing headline CPI. CPI is still quite benign at 1.5 percent. And property, uh, I mean, producer price inflation may remain high because of the skyrocketing oil prices, but that doesn't mean the upstream sectors would be able to pass on the rising cost to the downstream. Domestic demand is quite weak right now. It is very, very hard for retailers to hike prices. And the Chinese government will also use different kinds of administrative measures to curb the rising prices, right? And compared to other countries, China has the advantage of continued access to discounted Russian exports. Next slide, please. And that will also help offset some of the inflationary pressures, right? It is no secret that uh, China has been importing oil from Russia. As you can see on the left side, uh, the left chart, Russia has been the second, the second largest oil importer of China after Saudi Arabia, right? And on the tech, uh, on the on the uh, technical side, although Russian can no longer use the uh, Swiss platform, uh, but the bilateral trade between China and Russia could go through the uh, the CIPS, the cross border in the bank payment system, which is uh, de denominated in RMB, right? And the fact is that more and more trade between China and Russia has been settled in. RMB since 2014. The exact numbers for such trade is not available, uh, but the fact is that China runs trade deficits with Russia, and that enables Russia to accumulate RMB for bilateral, uh, bilateral trade. And on the right chart shows uh, official numbers. Uh, uh, this is the official numbers released by Russia. It is holding 13% of reserves. Uh, uh, in the Chinese yuan, okay? So in a nutshell, I don't see there's any technical hurdles uh, to stop them from doing, uh, you know, bilateral trade, all right? So, and I, I, I think this trend should not, be re should not be read as implicit economic support for Russia because many of these, uh, you know, strategic resources have been purchased through long-term contracts. 
So it should not be seen as a proactive purchases. But of course, but, uh, at the end of the day, it depends on uh, some of the policies released by the Washington. We'll be keeping a very close eye on this, All right? So yes, I think I'll, I'll, um, yeah, I'll end this section. Sorry, we're, uh, just a second, we're gonna run, uh, run out of time because we need to get to William, but very, very quick. The chart yeah. is very striking because it's not just Russia, but also Saudi Arabia is selling $43 billion worth of oil. What about an RMBification of that trade? I think that is positive, that is for sure, especially uh, recently uh, Saudi Arabia is talking about whether they would like to uh, have some of the oil trade to be denominated in the RMB, right? And as we all know, uh, petrol dollar is one of the reasons why the US dollar can be a uh, 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 number one international currency, right? So if we see more of this positive, positive development going forward regarding, you know, trade in renminbi, that will for sure boost up the renminbi's role uh, uh, in terms of international currency. Plus the fact that, you know, the RCEP is also promoting the use of the Chinese yuan. That's right. Um, shall we just move on to Wei Yang now? Yeah, sure. I'm done my yeah. part. All right, thanks. All right, excellent. Thanks. Okay, hey, William, go for it. All right, thanks, Timer and Nathan. I'll try to string together uh, the teams that uh, both uh, Timer and Nathan have raised and see what are implications for credit assets globally. So Nathan has talked about the prospects of Chinese infrastructure stimulus earlier. So next slide. So on from the chart on the left, to get a sense of scale, we look at the quarterly increase in the local government bonds outstanding. And we see that the increase in Q1, this is already double, more than double compared to what we saw in Q1 of last year. And this number includes record issuance of up about 1.25 trillion yuan of special local government bonds. And these bonds are directly linked to infrastructure projects. So clearly the magnitude of stimulus that's gonna to come to is significant. Uh, we think this will support Chinese credit in sectors that are most uh, exposed to infrastructure demand. So they include industrial credit, comprising of uh, SOEs in engineering, construction, railways, municipal water infrastructure. And if you look at the spreads of the industrial Chinese SOE, uh, which is the chart on the right, the spread has been steadily compressing uh, since the uh, depths of the pandemic. Uh, another sector that is poised to benefit will be basic materials. So as construction for new metro lines, for urban renewal, industrial parks pick up. So we think demand for steel is going to increase and this will likely benefit uh, Chinese steel producers within this space. Uh, however, note that there's a bifurcation going on within basic materials. Uh, uh, steel producers are doing well, but chemical producers spreads are widening. Uh, so the reason for this is because we have seen a surge in crude oil prices. So let's go on to the next slide and discuss what elevated crude prices imply for US and Asian credit. So one major reason why there's a surge in oil prices this year is, as mentioned by Timer, the Russian-Ukraine conflict and Russian crude is facing a voluntary boycott in Europe, uh, as well as a complete ban in the US. G7 countries as before pledge to cut their reliance on Russian oil over the long term. So this is a structural positive for most other oil producers, including the US producers. So let's go back and see what US producers have been doing uh, in terms of their production throughput, right? So on the chart on the left, uh, we've seen uh, that the, the a number of US rotary rates, although they have risen from their pandemic slows, uh, they're still well off from pre-pandemic levels. In terms of US crude production, they have only increased by about 10% from their average production level in 2020, and it's very far below this is quite far below its 2019 peak production. Uh, so why is there such a slow recovery? So if you look at uh, the amount of defaults in the energy sector, so that those are the gray bars on the chart. You've seen that due to the pandemic, there was a huge wave of energy sector defaults. And because of that, the survivors are now much more financially prudent than uh, in the past. So uh, what we're seeing is there's been increased capital discipline with the shale oil firms focused on paying down debt uh, rather than expanding production. Uh, second reason is that there has also been a pause in sales of uh, oil and gas leases on federal lands in the US, partly due to regulatory oversight. So overall, we see high capital discipline, slow output increases, and that structural demand shift away from Russian oil 
uh, to bolster credit for the US energy sector, particularly the high yield credit se uh, energy uh, sector. So this is because exploration and production or EMP firms form the largest proportion of uh, US high yield energy credit, followed by midstream firms. So both of these uh, uh, upstream and midstream firms will benefit uh, going forward. So some of these high yield firms are also fallen angels that were downgraded to uh, double B during the pandemic. So there's also a chance they could be re-rated back to investment grade. So that's, that's going to provide some scope for outside. So the picture is a clearly positive one for the US. Now, what about implications for Asian energy credit? So moving on to the next slide. Uh, we think that there may be a more nuanced and differentiated outcome in Asia. So the reason is because most Asian energy credit are from the national oil companies and they tend to be heavily integrated across the value chain. So there are contributions from profit coming not only from upstream EMP but also downstream refining and marketing activity. So there are only one or two Indian uh, NOCs that are more EMP focused. So we have to consider how our refining margins going to behave uh, in an environment rising crude prices. So if you look at the chart on the left, uh, the grey line shows the um, price of Dubai crude, which is the uh, relevant benchmark for Asian energy trading. And we've seen the prices have surged quite a lot from $80 per barrel and at the end of last year to now about $100 per barrel. Uh, and this red line shows the gas oil crack spread over Dubai uh, crude. So it shows the refining margin. Uh, so gas oil, they are middle distillates that are used for motor fuel. So the combination of rising crude oil prices and the rising refining margins show that pump prices are going to rise quite a fair bit uh, in the coming months. Um, so the question is, why is there a jump in crack spread or the gas oil crack spread? Uh, the main reason is due to supply disruptions. Uh, European refineries, they have stopped production because uh, they have completely stopped importation of uh, Russian crude. Uh, this is creating a shortage for distilled products. Uh, in the industry. But over the longer term, it's hard to see these refineries being left idle, right? So there will be more competition from Europe for Middle Eastern crude as a replacement for Russian crude. So in this case, the very high margins that we're seeing in refining could come under pressure and could normalize uh, in the coming months. And given that the, the current rise in crude oil prices is due to a supply shock and not a demand, uh, inc not increased demand, so it's quite unclear if the crack spread will show the usual positive correlation with um, crude oil prices at the past, when demand uh, tends to support both uh, refining margins as well as crude prices. So another issue is also to do with the fact that uh, in some of the emerging Asian countries, uh, fuel prices are dictated uh, by uh, government policies. So the pace of fuel price adjustment uh, will have an impact on downstream marketing prof, uh, profits as well. So just recently, Indonesia's state oil company has um, has been able to have a tight uh, 92 octane petrol prices by 35%. So that's a very significant hike, uh, completely eliminates um, margin pressures for them. Uh, but for the rest of Asia, uh, the adjustment has been a bit slower. Indian palm prices are being revised up, uh, after a four-month freeze but at a relatively slow pace. So the prices are higher by about 10%. So given the uncertainty and demand response, uh, and the fact that this crude oil jump is really due to supply shocks, we think headwinds on the downstream sides of uh, the, the industry will continue to remain. And that's probably mean that Asian energy credit spreads will see a more uh, nuanced outcome uh, compared to the US. Right, so finally, moving on to the last slide that I have, I will end with a comparison of how uh, credit spreads, uh, the performance of credit spreads in predicting a US recession. Uh, we know the US two-year, 10-year spread uh, often precedes a recession. Whenever the flat turns uh, to zero or to negative levels, uh, they tend to imply that a recession is going to come through. This was true both in 2001 and 2007. But if you look at the triple B rated US corporate spreads. So triple B bonds form the largest proportion of the US corporate bond market. So you know that the spreads actually did not give a very good performance. So back in 2001, uh, spreads did rise a little bit ahead of the recession. Uh, but in 2007, spreads were actually very close to cyclical lows heading into the recession. And that's partly because the stresses back then originate in the housing market and not in the corporate, uh, not from the corporate side. So uh, from that point of view, spreads does not seem to be a very good uh, indicator of whether recession uh, uh, likelihood has risen. 
But perhaps we are also looking at credit from a very one dimension perspective, right? So we focus on forward component of credit spreads. Uh, what does it what does it imply? So analogous to the slope of rates curve, uh, when there's curve inversion uh, that indicates expectation of forward rate cuts, the credit curve can also give an expectation of uh, forward credit spreads, whether credit spreads are expected to rise or fall over time. So if the credit curve starts to steepen, this usually means that markets think uh, credit spreads might widen from current levels. Uh, there's more risk over the horizon. Uh, and we did some analysis on the core movement of credit spreads of uh, Asian uh, companies, and we could actually extract uh, both a level factor and a slope factor. So a level factor is the factor that represents uh, the average spread across the entire credit curve. The slope factor is one that represents the differential between short duration and long duration spreads. So whenever the, uh, the slope of the credit curve is rising, uh, that means the slope factor is actually rising. So if you look at the chart on the right, uh, it shows the two factors um, since uh, 2017, uh, uh, very clearly during the period of monetary tightening uh, back from in, in Q3 of 2017 to, to, to Q3 of 2019 when the Fed was unwinding its balance sheet. Uh, uh, we see not just credit spread levels rising, but also the slope of credit spread increasing quite significantly during this period. So markets were actually anticipating some slowdown in Asia arising uh, from uh, the Fed's policy tightening at that stage. Um, so let's look at how uh, spreads have performed in the most recent period. So the slope factor has also started to rise from its, uh, uh, from its low back in uh, January of 2021. It has risen quite significantly indicating that perhaps uh, risks are starting to appear over the horizon. So that's one reason why we think a more cautious stance could be warranted for Asian credit markets, especially given that the overall level of spreads is still quite near to cyclical lows. Uh, so with that, I'll end my presentation and pass over the timer uh, to, for the Q&A. Uh, thank you, William. Very little time left. Let's just stay with that slide of yours, slide 30. Uh, let's stay with last slide 30, please, previous slide. Thank you. Uh, that the issue of, you know, the recent steepening of uh, Asian credit spread. Uh, so we've had a bit of a topsy-turvy situation, haven't we? That we've saw some compression as well, and then we've seen some widening. Um, why have we seen periods of compression in the middle of this relentless interest rate pressure? So I think there's still um, very much uh, positioning for reopening. Um, so we know that Asian economies are only starting to relax travel restrictions in uh, recent months. Uh, so activity are st is levels are still expected to increase going forward. And remember that there was also Omicron and Delta waves that have held back the recoveries for many Asian economies. So for the case of Thailand, they, they saw a Q3 dip uh, last year and they are only starting to find its feet again uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the, the COVID infection waves retreating uh, somewhat. So that's partly, I think, one reason why credit markets uh, have been keen to invest in uh, Asian dollar credit, expecting continued and sustained economic momentum. But I think the picture is a bit more complex now with the Fed uh, nudging markets towards expecting, firstly, a faster pace of uh, rate hikes, and secondly, a faster pace of uh, balance sheet reduction. So the risks are definitely uh, rising uh, over, over the near term. But for now, I think markets are still somewhat focused on, uh, on, on the upside from potential uh, recovery in economic activity. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, when during the Ukraine-Russian uh, conflict, when spreads uh, generally rose very fast uh, in the immediate aftermath of the news, they have steadily compressed since then. Uh, but I think we are starting to see a lot more uh, complex um, complexity in the credit environment now. So probably some degree of caution is needed, especially with spread levels still uh, very close to uh, the cyclical lows. Uh, thank you, well, Yang. Uh, there was more to talk about, but we have frankly run out of time. Uh, I just want to wrap up with that point that we've got three shocks going on right now. One is the US economy about to undergo a bit of an interest rate shock and quantitative tightening on the back of COVID inflation, but 
we also have the conflict inflation coming out of Europe, which not only will complicate the uh, inflation picture overall, which was already afflicted by COVID inflation, but also create major negative demand downside for the Euro area. And then we have the China dynamic, which you heard from Nathan, is not that straightforward. On one hand, the authorities are actually doing quite a few growth and market supporting measures, but at the same time, there is this big overhang of uncertainty around a uh, beleaguered corporate sector uh, on property, particularly exposure, but also uh, to what extent do we see domestic demand uh, you know, get affected deeply by uh, these stringent COVID measures, even if the authorities manage to keep the supply chain open and the external side remains seamless. So three shocks at the same time for an otherwise relatively okay economy coming to 2022 is creating a bit of a dour picture where we're going to see slowing growth and perhaps lingering high inflation for the time being. Not a very good combination. We've got to keep an eye on what that means for markets for the time being. Uh, we just you know, stop right there. Uh, you'd like to thank our uh, colleagues in our GSMC, our communications team, uh, Surendran uh, Stapa, Shamshuddin Hamid. Uh, also, uh, let's not forget uh, uh, Isaac Chu, uh, who have been tirelessly supporting this three time zone production. So thanks, guys, and everybody stay safe. Uh, we will see you again in May. Have a great day.